I want to talk about money. Not because I want some, but because it's interesting. I never cared much for money, actually. I don't need very much of it. I don't really want to travel. I don't care for entertainment. And only a small amount of luxury is desirable to me. Both for better and for worse, those things do not make me happy. For myself, as long as I have food, clothing, friends, a bed, and plenty of time, money is worth very little to me. But I'm fascinated by money because it reveals how consciousness interacts with reality. It's often been said, money is power. But what money is depends on who is looking. In a general sense, money is much more than power. For some, money is freedom. For others, money is security. For some, it is fun. For others, it is success. Now, of course, money itself is none of those things. But it looks like those things to those people. They have faith that money can give them what they desire. And so the money becomes a proxy for desire. Even gold is not objectively valuable, but its subjective value is very, very stable. Gold is rare. It impresses us, and it doesn't tarnish. For these primary reasons, rarity, beauty, and permanence, it is valuable. It may surprise some of you to hear this, but I don't believe in objective value, because I do not believe in objectivity. However, I do believe there is a finite number of ways that the world can be usefully perceived by humans, and these functional perspectives all have certain basic features in common. Value, and the basic principles that govern it, are among those constants. This is almost the same as belief in objective value, but not exactly the same, because it means value is wobbly, that no explanation of value can be offered which is not false. We may only offer explanations which are true enough almost all of the time. This is why something which is not apparently valuable, like a piece of paper backed by nothing, can magically be made valuable, at least for a while. The banknotes of the past, it is said, used the gold standard, because every dollar was worth a standard amount of gold. From this gold, we're told, the dollars derived their value. But this story leaves something out. What was the gold backed by? What made the gold valuable? Certainly not its utility. Gold is nice to look at, but not for very long. Perhaps the value is in the rarity of gold. But this drawing I made is far rarer. It's in fact one of a kind. How much would you pay for it? I would argue that gold is backed by all the resources and energy which other people are willing to trade for it. What then are those backed by? What makes them valuable? We will find that the final answer to this line of questioning, the thing at the very bottom of value, is something like the human will. Not the will to live exactly, but the will to thrive and flourish. The force which animates. That is what money is really backed by. Or rather, what money symbolizes. It is crystallized will, pure motive force, represented by a physical object. To the extent that you desire, money is valuable. If we all desired nothing, that's what money would be worth. Now we may ask, what is this animating force? Etymologically, the common root of both animal and animate is anima, the Latin word for soul. To ask at the essence of such a thing, we must turn to religion. Rationality is far too weak for such a question. In Genesis, God creates Adam by breathing life into him. This is how he animates his creation. That is, how he gives him a soul. The word used for breath in the Old Testament is ruach. In the New Testament Greek, it is pneuma. These words mean both spirit and breath. 
The same link is found in the words inspiration and respiration, both of which have the same root as spirit. Scripture tells us that man is made in the image of God. To a large extent, this is because unlike other animals, we create like God. And indeed, we create like God by breathing our own spirit into our creations. We created money. We named it and we breathed life into it. Every human creation is like this. But I chose money as our example for two reasons. First, money represents nearly pure value. It is not the desire for any particular thing, but rather the desire for things in general. Second, money is quantified. What this means is that in money, we have condensed this animating force into a form which can be both empirically observed and approximately measured. This means that just as leaves can show us what the wind is doing, money will physically map some currents of invisible psychic energy. Perhaps that's why we call it currency. Because it does this, we can directly observe the behavior of this psychic energy and watch what it does to the world around it. In this way, we can learn how it works, even when we can't see it. The stock market is already conducting this experiment. We need only observe it to get the results. And what we see when we watch the stock market is this. The more psychic energy that we invest in a given entity, the more manifest that entity becomes. And entity is the right word, because remember, corporations are people. And as our condensed will is pumped into them, they become more powerful. They gain the strength to move mind and matter. This suggests exactly what I've already said. Money is indeed a symbolic proxy for a spiritual force which animates and gives life, for psychic energy, for will. In exactly the same way that money can be invested in companies, a portion of the human spirit, of the collective will, has been invested in currencies. As we lose faith in a company, we withdraw the dollars we have invested, and then we say the company lost value. Likewise, as we lose confidence in the dollar, we withdraw the projections we invested there, and the dollar loses value. The less faith we have in the dollar, the less real the dollar is. Because if we had no faith in the dollar, the dollar would cease to exist. I think it is a good idea to call this energy spirit, because as I've said, the Greek word for spirit is pneuma, and spirit works pneumatically. The economy and the stock market are like a pneumatic system. They are full of centers which inflate and deflate. And just as air must ever flow in and out of the body and its tissues, so too must money ever circulate. If this stops happening, the body will die. If we look at my cosmogram, we will see that the suit of coins is associated with the Gnostic Demiurge, with Saturn or Yaldabaoth. This is the mythological being who can find spirit in physical matter. That was how I figured out what money was doing. Put your ear to a dollar bill, and if you can hear it all, you will hear the crackling of fire and the howling of the damned. Let's rewind a little. How does spirit get trapped in the dollar bills? I've already said that the perception of value in a dollar bill is a projection. In Jungian psychology, the projection-making factor, the part of the psyche which projects the unconscious onto the world, is called the anima in men and the animus in women. There again is that word. It is my anima who puts the appearance of value on this sigil. That projection is a part of my mind, just as much as my stomach is a part of my body. And the same way that my stomach can influence my consciousness, so too can the projection. It cannot make me do anything, but it can try. Three primary factors determine how powerful the projection will be. How strong is my desire? How great is my faith in the projection? And how weak is my ego? If all three of these factors align, 
this projection becomes very dangerous because it is a part of me that is not conscious and its influence rivals the part that is. It is not helpful to think that this trapped energy is inside or outside of our heads. In important ways, it is both. The meaning is within and the paper is without. But from our perspective, the two are not different. The outside world and the unconscious can never be meaningfully differentiated, as I've already said. For a while, I've had a name for the force wielded by these projections against consciousness. And I got it from physics. When a large amount of matter is concentrated in one place, modern physics says it warps space and time and generates something which we call gravity. On the other hand, when a large amount of this spirit becomes concentrated in one place, it warps the collective unconscious and generates something which I call gravitas. In Latin, gravitas means heaviness, and weight is often used in English to mean importance. Likewise, in common parlance, a person with gravitas is someone with a presence, someone who is important and should be taken seriously. Kings have gravitas, and just like money, the reason a king has power is because a large group of people project power onto him. Now, the important point here is that once this starts happening, it likes to keep happening. Because the more people there are who believe in these projections, the more reality they have. If a hundred people will do what a certain man tells them, then that man has some power. The more power he has, the more dangerous he becomes. The more dangerous he becomes, the more frightening he is. And the more frightening he is, the more power he has. Gravitas is best defined as the capacity of an idea to alter reality. We must say an idea because it is not the paper bills which change reality, but the idea that they signify. This is why something else, like a check, for example, can often do the same job as the bills. Now, money is just the most obvious illustration of this effect. In a drug addiction, an emanation is projected onto a certain substance. The projected emanation is always the complement to the addict's feeling of lack. If the addict is depressed, the drug is happiness. If the addict is in pain, the drug is comfort. If the addict is bored, the drug is novelty. The emanation is then animated. This happens when the addict believes it, when he buys it, when he falls for the sales pitch. Now, there is almost always actual purchasing involved in a drug addiction. And if we recall what money really is, we will recognize that purchasing is a ritual sacrifice. But even when there is no purchase, the sacrifice of time is sufficient. After all, time is money. As this process of animation goes on, the thoughts about the drug become more and more autonomous, and the addict's ego becomes less autonomous. Increasingly, the drug thoughts are in charge. He is giving his life to the voice he hears in the drug, and he does it by selling his soul. The most interesting effects of these emanations appear when they're projected onto people. If a large number of people project status and importance onto a certain man, that is, if many people respect, admire, and praise him, strange things start to happen. In the first place, certain suggestible people will start doing the same thing, whether or not they know why. Secondly, and more interestingly, his stress will diminish, his serotonin levels will increase, he will produce more testosterone, which will cause his body to become more muscular. His brain will function better. He will be more confident, more driven, and less anxious. He'll sleep better. He'll be less likely to get sick. He will have more energy. Women will find him more attractive. All of these things happen to people with high status. People in whom others have invested psychic energy. Now, skeptics will say I'm using the word energy as a placeholder for other things that what I'm calling by that name is a myriad of factors, that that word in that context does not refer to anything physical and specific. Neither does the word dollar. But we agree to use the shorthand because the word is just so good at explaining what happens. Dollars are not objects. They do not exist in physical space. Like I said at the beginning of this video, a dollar is an insubstantial unit of abstract motivation. 
It is only a way of talking about and programming a constellation of physical patterns. But you forget that, because it works. The best example of a collective projection with power is an attractive woman. If a very attractive woman enters a room full of men and begins signaling that she is available, she becomes an object of motivation. And indeed, the fact that it's happening on a large scale, that many suitors are reifying the projection, makes the projection stronger and more stable. Because many people desire the woman, the opportunity represented by her availability is not likely to last. The urgency increases her desirability, and her desirability increases the urgency. Additionally, the group's belief that the woman is desirable makes each individual more sure that she is. The same thing is happening with money. If only a few people believe in a currency, the projected value is unstable. It is liable to simply dissipate. But like gold, if everyone believes in it, the value is stabilized. Now, what this begins to reveal is that as we synchronize our minds, we build and open up channels for invisible forces to pass through them. If a group of people believe in dollars, then dollars can move seamlessly from one mind to another. This is exactly what language is doing. It is ideas moving unimpeded between human minds. But it is important to remember that interpretation is not done consciously. Like I said before, you do not have to try to understand the meaning of words you know. Likewise, when you speak, you do not consciously move your mouth to form the words. Thus, put simply, most of both incoming and outgoing communication is handled by the unconscious. Body language is a perfect example of this. There is probably an information exchange going on all the time, which is far more complicated than the one we see. Invisible forces are using us as conduits to reify their existence. Some of them are symbiotic, others parasitic. There will always be a kind of psychic ecology. The best we can do is not let it control us. To have a reciprocal and intentional relationship with it. To help the forces sympathetic to humanity and starve out those which are hostile. Perhaps this is why St. Paul said that we will judge the angels. Forces much larger than those we perceive are at play around us and in what we do. But they are not somewhere else. They're right in front of us. They're made of this. And the less we believe that, the less clearly we will see them. And the less clearly we see them, the more vulnerable we are. Until next time, thank you for watching and be well.